Okay, I think it is uh, time to begin. And uh, if you're if you're here for the sectional on teaching parents to catechize in the home, that's this end of the room. And uh, Pastor Gillespie and I are going to work together. And uh, I'm going to take the first part. He's going to take the second part. And uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. My aim uh, is to lay some foundations, some scriptural theological foundations for the role that uh, parents are given by God to teach their children the faith. Uh, and uh, I don't think I probably have to convince you that parents have this responsibility, but I want to maybe unpack that a bit from the examples and the texts of scripture themselves. I think my sense is that, that Lutherans, at least Really educated Lutherans are well aware of the fact that in the catechism, Dr. Luther talks about how the head of the family should teach his children or his family to pray, to confess, um, to remember their baptism and so forth. So in, in some respects, that's just a given. Uh, but uh, let, let's go back to the very beginning. We just had the reading uh, yesterday and then again this morning uh, about Cain and Abel, which takes us right back to Adam and his children. And uh, it's perhaps, maybe it's not self-evident, but it seems self-evident to me, and I think Dr. Luther uh, is, is pretty adamant about this, that Adam has taught his sons, Cain and Abel, uh, to uh, call on the name of the Lord, to sacrifice, and, uh, and then this is passed down through one side of the family at least, through uh, Abel, first of all, and then Seth after Abel was killed. So both, both Cain and Abel know what they're supposed to do, and the difference between the two boys is not uh, you know, in their outward actions, but faith. So Abel is offering in faith. The letter to the Hebrews tells us that his sacrifice is regarded by the Lord because he offers it in faith. And that faith, of course, is in especially the promise of the seed that uh, God gave immediately after the fall. And uh, the children know it because the father has taught them. Adam has taught his sons. Adam really is, he's the pastor, he's the priest, he's the president, he's the father, he's everything for his sons. And one of the things that I would like to contend is that that's still to a certain extent the case. That what pastors are within the church, fathers are within the home. So uh, I, I'll make that point in various ways. But Adam teaches his sons, not only teaches them the promise, but he teaches them um, how to exercise their faith and how to worship God. Uh, thinking, thinking of Luther again, if, if it's been a while since you read the Genesis lectures or if you've never read them, um, go back and look at what Luther says about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for example. I mean, this is, it's just profound. And the question, you know, why did God make this tree in the first place? Why does he, you know, create this thing and then forbid them to use it? And it's so that they have a means and a way of worshiping him. And Adam has now also taught his sons how to worship God by offering sacrifices of thanksgiving. Except, of course, Cain, Cain doesn't offer in faith and with thanksgiving, but Abel does. And you have Seth, and at that point, I think, uh, is when uh, Moses tells us that Men began to call on the name of the Lord. In contrast to uh, Cain's family, what's interesting, and it's right there in the text, but I hadn't thought about it deeply until uh, working my own way through Luther's commentary, is the sons of Cain are really excelling in all those things that we and our families and our parishioners like to excel in. Science, art, industry, probably sports too. Um, and they're, they're the big achievers. They're the big dogs. They're the giants in the land. And Luther takes that not as a reference to their stature, but to their accomplishments. They're, 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 the, they're the big achievers. They're the success stories. Uh, whereas uh, Seth's family, rather remarkably, uh, dwindles. And Luther's contention is that they're under duress, they're under persecution, they're the, they're the small kind of number. In spite of the fact that you have these illustrious patriarchs, think about the fact that it comes down to one man and his immediate family. That's all that's left who are counted righteous by faith in the promise. 
But how is it that Noah is counted righteous? He, he believes God and in faith he obeys God. And where does that come from? It comes from this line of the sons of God who believe the promise and teach the promise to their children. There's a reason why it follows the line. Cain's family, Seth's family, uh, down to Noah. Enoch walks with God. Noah believes God. He's counted faithful. God tells him what to do when he does it. And um, at least in uh, Luther's estimation, the sons of Noah also are faithful because they believe the promise. They're all included in the ark, uh, even though um, the one son is going to be rejected uh, for his sin. At least this is Luther's taking on it. To call on the name of the Lord uh, points us to the fact that it's not just about head knowledge. I mean, certainly Adam would have told them the stories of what happened in the garden and so forth. Uh, and he would have told them the promise. And so there's, there's intellectual content, there's affirmation and assent to the, to the promise, but there's also the practice, there's prayer, there's sacrifice. Uh, faith is exercising itself in these ways. And then also uh, uh, is of course to exercise itself in love for the neighbor. I'm gonna, well, I guess that's part of the point, is that he's teaching the ways and means of worship. So underline that point. Keep it in mind. I don't want to go into too much detail on some of the Old Testament things, as interesting as they are, because things change, obviously, with the coming of our Lord and the context that we have. But in principle, what I want to say is, he teaches the, he teaches the promise and he teaches the practice of worship, how, how they are to worship God. Uh, and of course, the promise itself is rooted in family, if you will, because even though childbirth is cursed, the man and the woman are bound together. Uh, they're going to need each other in order to survive. The woman's desire is for her husband. The husband's going to have to work to take care of his family. And then right, right there in that uh, consequence of sin, there's the promise that the seed of the woman is going to crush the devil's head. And we, we know that finally the, the woman, of course, is the Blessed Virgin Mary, and it's not by the normal means of, of procreation. And yet, where did Mary come from? And there is the tracing of the seed through all the generations, and obviously you're all familiar with that. But I simply want to point to the, uh, the familial context, both of the promise itself and the handing over the promise in the, from Adam to Seth and down the line to Noah. Jump ahead, following Noah, you have uh, Father Abraham. And again, even though you've got this old man and his old barren wife, the promise is connected to the fact that he's going to have a son and that by his son, uh, you know, the nations are going to be blessed, his family is going to be blessed, all the nations of the world are going to bless themselves. And so you have the narrowing of the promise of the seed and uh, again, the familial context of uh, God's work, his promise, the covenant that he's made. And in particular, uh, the covenant of circumcision, which, uh, I, I mean, we all know this, and it's just, it's just there in the text, but can you imagine a more kind of odd covenant? <laughs> I mean, this is the covenant. You're going to cut some skin off your private parts. That's the covenant I'm making with you. And the fathers are to do this for their sons. And so it, it's not unlike the cursing of childbirth and then the promise of the seed of the woman who's going to be the, the serpent crusher. You have the promise that Abraham is, is going to have, have sons. And the, the promise is going to be given to his seed. And then to mark that promise, the very part of his body that is most intimately connected to the bearing of children is marked in this very odd way. And God says, this is my covenant. This is my promise that I'm binding to you and to your family. Now, ultimately, of course, we have the circumcision made without hands, holy baptism. And we pray that our hearts would be circumcised by the spirit. But with Abraham, it is also in the flesh of his body. And... Uh, and directly connected to the flesh of his body as father to his sons. And his sons have to be taught as well to do this to their sons. And, and so you have this. There is that interesting event with um, 
Moses, who hasn't circumcised his son, and then they're on their way, and Moses is being sent as the prophet, and then God confronts them, and and uh, is it his wife Zipporah that basically has to? So she, this is why he's called a bridegroom of blood. But um, I mean, it is so typical in the history of the God's people that the things God has given His people to do, to teach, and to practice get forgotten. My my wife for years has had this saying that that the, the faith is always one generation away from extinction. I mean, the Lord obviously preserves his church, but her point is that parents do have the responsibility to hand the faith on to their children. If that breaks down, no, nowhere else, frankly, does God visit the sin of the fathers upon the children more profoundly than when the fathers fail to catechize their children in the faith to teach them the word and promise of God, to teach them how to pray and confess, and to bring them to church to worship the Lord in the spirit and the truth. So um, you have this attached to them in this very intimate way, but they have, to, they have to then pass it on. I mean, Abraham's children are not just gonna grow up knowing that, oh yeah, if the boys are born, we should take a knife and just slice away there. Um, you do have the teaching of the father to the son. And it's not, uh, I, what, what I would like to suggest is it's not incidental that, that Abraham is known as Father Abraham. And he is the father of all those who believe. The, the image of the father is, um, is, is profound. And in a little bit, I'm going to talk a little more about the fact that all fatherhood on earth is named by the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but, but the significance of fatherhood... <coughs> I, I suppose in our day and age, this is one of the things that falls under the attack of, uh, you know, being patriarchal and, um, and and sexist, perhaps in some way. But I, I would hope that as Christians, we don't we don't think about it in those terms. That the father does have this unique opportunity and responsibility to practice the faith and to teach the faith and to hand the faith over to his children. So then you have not only Father Abraham. Uh, but also then the sons of Israel. And again, it's a family. Now, what I would like to suggest uh, is that we should not, we should not uh, conclude from that that the, the real locus of the church's life and the real locus of, uh, of the faith is the family as opposed to the church, for example. But what I would like to say is that we learn to understand the church as the household and family of God because of the way that he establishes the faith through the family of Adam, through the family of Abraham, uh, and so on and so forth. So that, that's part of uh, the contention that I would like to make. When you have the, uh, the exodus from Egypt, I think this comes very much to the fore because the, uh, obviously the pass, well, first of all, the 10th plague itself, the the death of the firstborn sons, and again, the, the familial context. Um, Pharaoh and all his, his folks in Egypt are gonna be, they're gonna be disciplined, they're gonna be chastised, they're gonna be hardened in this way. But God preserves the sons of Israel, and it's the fathers who are the instruments of their salvation. Um, because the fathers are the one who are entrusted with choosing the lamb, sacrificing the lamb, doing with the lamb the things that God has instructed, um, preparing the lamb, using its blood on the doorpost. And interestingly, if the family is too small, uh, the, the lamb is to feed the whole family and it's all to be consumed. And if the family is too small, then the, the family is to get together with the neighbors so that they can, they can become a household together. I love, I love the picture of the Passover because what you have then is a picture of the father who selects the lamb and sacrifices him and then applies his blood to us and feeds us with his flesh. So um, I still remember one of the most beautiful things I learned from seminary my first, my first semester when Dr. Weiner just put up on the board a very simple diagram of the, the, the bishop on one side of the altar and the altar and the people and the bishop standing in the place of the father and giving the son to, to his children. Uh, I mean, this is really what you have happening in the Passover. And it's, it's, a, it's the Old Testament liturgy. And it's happening uh, within the home and family according to the word of God. And, and so there is this household and family that, that God establishes. 
But I like the fact that the smaller families are to invite their neighbors and join together because then you then it's not just kind of me and my bride and my children by ourselves, but there's a, there even though it's rooted in the home and family, there's also a sense of the wider community. And it is the sons of Israel, it is the people of God. They're brought out of Egypt together. And uh, uh, of course the Lord makes it clear that all of your sons now belong to me, right? They, they're spared, but, and it's not only the sons, obviously, the, all of the people belong to God, but he says specifically, your sons belong to me because I spared them. Uh, and uh, so then, you know, some of them are redeemed and the Levites are dedicated to service. And that finally is fulfilled with the presentation of our Lord in the temple. Uh, he is the firstborn son of God whom the father calls out of Egypt. And even though he's not a Levite, he's dedicated for service and finally for sacrifice. But this, I mean, this is rooted right in the, the prior history because what is Abraham given to do with his son? And then he's spared at the last moment. I mean, the Passover is really Abraham and Isaac all over again. And God provides the lamb in place of the son until he provides his own son as the lamb uh, in place of us all. And the Passover is rooted in this uh, familial paternal celebration. The father has the responsibility to do this for his family. Now, later in Deuteronomy, um, you, you know, the fathers are to instruct their children and you have this, this pattern of catechesis, which I'll say more about in a bit, but uh, I wanted to start with that. God brings them out of Egypt and into the wilderness into Mount Sinai. And then at Mount Sinai, he actually enacts the covenant with them. And here you have, if the Passover is kind of the primary thing and very much a type of the Lord's Supper, and then you have the manna in the wilderness, very much a type of the Lord's Supper. And this is, I mean, this is right out of Chemnitz, the Lord's Supper. Everybody recognizes this. Passover, manna, and then at Mount, and then at Mount, um, yeah, Mount Sinai, you have, this is the blood of the covenant. And it's uh, the very words that our Lord takes up and then um, renews in himself. This is my blood of the new covenant. And at the foot of Mount Sinai, God establishes his covenant with Israel. The blood is applied on the altar to God and sprinkled on the people. And the elders of Israel go up on the mountain and they eat and drink in God's presence. And he doesn't stretch out his hand to slay them, but he stretches out his hand to feed them and to bless them. So at Mount Sinai, God establishes this covenant and I will be your God and you will be my people. If you look throughout the scriptures, the language is not just God and people, but father and children. You know, God becomes the father of, and when, when God, uh, I think it's the same, yeah, it's either the same or one of the many other times that God gets angry because the people are so stubborn and sinful, and then Moses, as a type of Christ, intercedes for them. And uh, God says, this, these people that you brought out of Egypt, look at them, they're not obeying. I'm going to scratch them and start over with you. And Moses says, no, no, you're the one who begot this people and carried them out of Egypt. I mean, this is really the language of, Who's their father? And God has become their father in redeeming them from, from Egypt, and he makes his covenant with them. And one of the, one of the things that I've explored, um, especially over the last year, in thinking about the way God uses his law, and, and really wrestling with the way Luther talks about this in the small and large catechisms, you have that language from, you know, what does God say about all these commandments? And then Luther explains this. God threatens to punish all who break these commandments, therefore we should fear his wrath, not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all those who keep these commandments, therefore we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. That, that I mean, it's Luther, but that really troubled me as a child and as a young person. I thought this sounds, this sounds like the opposite of everything I've learned as a Lutheran. It sounds like you know, God rewards good works. Well, come to find out, our confessions do actually teach this. The scriptures do actually teach this. We don't earn our righteousness. We don't earn forgiveness. We don't earn salvation by our good works. But God does promise grace and every blessing to those who keep his commandments. He's very explicit about that. For example, when he says, honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. St. Paul says this is the first commandment with a promise, but they all have this promise. And as I thought about that and wrestled with it, I realized this is exactly the way fathers train their children. You, you give rules and regulations of what the children are to do and what they are not to do. And hopefully you're consistent in applying 
uh, appropriate consequences when those rules are either kept or broken. And what you're doing is you're training and teaching your children what is good and right and what is wrong, both for their own safety and benefit and also for the safety and benefit of their neighbors, beginning with their own siblings, but also learning how to be and function within the world. And I mean, the ones, I, I use examples with my little catechumens that I'm sure you can resonate with, like if you've got a little child who's fond of putting their hand up on a stove, and mom or dad might slap that hand and it's gonna sting and it's gonna maybe frighten them. But what are you doing? You're, you're teaching them there's consequences to doing this in order that, by God's grace, they not put their hand up on the stove when the burner's on. And this is really the way the Lord deals with his people. He says, here are my commandments. Here's what you are to do and not to do. And there are threats and punishments that go along with that. He's not teaching them how to justify themselves, how to save themselves, how to atone for their sins. He's teaching them how to live as his children. He's being a father to them, right? Um, one of the ways I like to put this, which I have found helpful, is you don't become a child of God and part of the family. You don't, you don't find your place in the home and family by keeping the rules. But rather, you're given the rules as to how to live because you are a child of God. You're part of the family. You have a place in the home. And uh, uh, as I uh, have, have thought, you know, how to, how to express this, one of, one of the ways I put it is um, for a child, I, I remember back in college already struggling with how, do, how is it that a parent disciplines his child and yet still forgives the child and loves the child? and all kinds of ideas. And I, and I had classmates that said, well, you know, my mom and dad would spank me and then they'd give me a hug and tell me they love me. And I thought, okay, well, that, that might work or it might confuse the child, I'm not sure. I think parents um, have to know their own children and know how to deal with them. But the way I like to think about it is the love and forgiveness of parents isn't um, similar <coughs> to what I was saying in our discussion uh, with Dr. Gibbs. Uh, it, it's not an emotion or a feeling, but it's, it's an activity and it's, um, it's an ongoing benefit. So for example, the child still has a place in the home and a bed to sleep in, even if he's set to bed early uh, for some infraction. The child still has food and clothing, even if he doesn't get dessert. The, the, the child is still a child, still provided for, is still loved even though he is disciplined for his infractions. And there's a place in the home, there's the safety and security of the home. And as the letter to the Hebrews tells us, a father disciplines his sons because he loves them uh, in order to train them and teach them. And if we understand that fathers do this for their children, uh, we should understand, of course, that God does this for his children. What I'm suggesting is that at Mount Sinai, we see God does this for his children. So we who are fathers learn to do this for our children and how to do it according to the word of God. Um, okay, when you, when you move from Mount Sinai, well, I should mention again Deuteronomy 6 because there the Lord is very explicit and I'm sure you're all very familiar with the passage where the fathers are told, teach this to your children when they get up in the morning and as they go through their day and when they go to bed at night, tie it you know, to the frontals and the robes and, and so on. It, it's quite explicit there. and I. I would offer, and I doubt that I'd get any disagreement, that this isn't just Old Testament, but uh, very much also in the New Testament as well, that fathers have this responsibility for their children. To see um, you know, the continuation of the Lord's, what I would say, his discipline and his pedagogical method, if you will, you have the manna. I already mentioned the manna, but what does God say later in Deuteronomy? Uh, this was to test them, whether they would live according to his word or not. So they, they learn to live um, by faith in their daily bread because that's as much as they're given. And if they try to take more, that's not going to work. But everybody gets as much as they need for each day. And then for the Sabbath day, they get enough on Friday. And the Sabbath is the other kind of main, what I would call pedagogy, if you will, because, uh, you know, will, are, are the people going to be content to actually rest themselves in the Lord, in his word, and his work. I mean, this is the biggest irony of the scriptures in some ways. 
I, I, I've been fond of saying that the Sabbath is already God teaching justification by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works of the law, long before Luther came along, even before Paul came along. Because what is he? He's absolutely adamant. Nobody is to work at all. Don't do anything. Not you, not your children, not your servants, not your animals. None of you work. No work at all. Especially on the Day of Atonement. Okay, the people are not to work. So why is this such a hard commandment to keep? Well, it's because by nature we want to live by our own works. We've got our own plans. We've got our own ambitions. We got our own. So, I mean, the Sabbath is also one of the ways in which God tests the people and trains the people and teaches the people uh, to live by faith in him, in his word, in his work, and not their own words and their own works. Um, I, I mean, I... I think there is instructiveness in that for fathers uh, in the way that they train their children as well, both in terms of the way they give gifts to their children and the way they teach their children to receive gifts. Uh, I would suggest that saying thank you, please, and so on and so forth is not just etiquette or politeness, but is it, it ought to be a training in the way of faith, the way that a child lives. Uh, and, and similarly, that the, that the father gives rest to his children. He feeds his children. He protects his children. He clothes his children. And in all of these ways, the children are learning to know what, what their father is like. Not just their father on earth, but, it, but to know uh, what their father in heaven is like. Now, I realize there's a lot of dads that don't even come close. And frankly, none of us dads are the fathers that we should be. And uh, I'll have people raise the objection that, well, you know, for people who have abusive fathers or absent fathers or, or whatever, this image of God as the father doesn't work. But that's, it's thinking about it backwards. We fathers learn to be fathers from the one who is the father. And he doesn't fall short. And he isn't abusive. And he isn't absent. He keeps his promises. And he loves his children. And uh, so we take our cues from him. Okay. Um, I, I have... I guess in my outline you have here, I hope this is not too clever, uh, but what I, what I like to do is to think about the prophets, the priests and Levites, the judges and kings have a paternal kind of duty and office. They are, they are fatherly instruments of God the Father. And by the same token, fathers in the home, for their own homes and families, have royal, priestly, and prophetic duties, which I mean, just to summarize, I would, I would say that they teach. They are to teach their children, and especially to teach them the word of God, but not only that, to teach them how to live in the world according to God's word, to pray and to sacrifice with and for their children, and as Adam did for his sons and so forth, to teach them how to pray and how to sacrifice so that it's not just giving instruction, but also uh, exemplifying that instruction, praying and sacrificing for them, and also teaching them to pray and sacrifice. And then finally to judge, to use discernment and discretion and to, to judge, to discipline, to resolve disputes between, between children. Uh, so that there are these duties that fathers carry out in the homes, just as the, the prophets, the priests and Levites, the, and the judges and kings of Israel carry out for the community of Israel. And uh, I, I know this is a bit general. I hope you're able to, to kind of follow my train of thought. Part of what I'm already leading up to and trying to lay the groundwork for is the way that there is a, a, uh, a synthesis and a continuity between the home and family and the life of the church, is what I'm trying to suggest. Not in any kind of competition, not as alternative options, but very much a consistency and a continuity between them. We do have uh, these beautiful examples, um, and there's not perhaps a lot of them, but there are these two uh, Elkanah in the Old Testament, um, the father of Samuel, and then in the New Testament, Joseph. I spent most of my life not really thinking a lot about Joseph other than he's part of the nativity side. Um, I mean, partly because unlike most of us, and certainly unlike me, he never says a word. He's, he just quietly does what God tells him to do. Immediately gets up and does it. But to think about the profound office and vocation that St. Joseph was given. And this, this is part of the mystery of the incarnation and, and our Lord's becoming true man, 
uh, and, uh, and the fact that Joseph is the one who teaches Jesus the word of God and teaches him how to pray and brings him to church and demonstrates to the little Lord Jesus how a godly husband cares for his wife. Uh, I mean, that, that is remarkable. Uh, and, but this is what he does. Uh, and Elkanah in the Old Testament, in both of these men, we have specific examples of how they faithfully brought their families to church. They did exactly what God laid out for them uh, in his word. That at certain times of the year, the liturgical year, I, the liturgical year is one of those things that, that Lutherans at least don't seem to get into fights about because everybody recognizes how beautiful it is and it traces through the life of Christ and it lays the scriptures out for us. So we all, we all I think, generally can. And, and it is adiaphora in the sense that the New Testament church here is nowhere spelled out in the scriptures for, it, for us. The church across the ages and across different parts of the world has done it a little bit differently here and there. But the thing of it is that the basic foundations of our New Testament church here are basically the fulfillment of the Old Testament church here, which is somewhat evident uh, even in the Gospels and uh, in some of Paul's epistles. And uh, at the appropriate time, the head of the household brings his family to Jerusalem uh, to, to be in the presence of God and to rejoice in the Lord and to receive his gifts and to join their amen to the prayers of Israel for the redemption of his people. Elkanah does this uh, at the house of the Lord in Shiloh. St. Joseph does this in bringing his family to Jerusalem. And of course, then you have that, that tension, which goes to show that the, the father in his own home and family cannot take the place of the Lord within his church, because you know at 12, you obviously have that um, attention did you not know I must be about my father's business I must be in my father's house I know I have become somewhat aware that apparently within within some circles um, you know there's this idea of house church or home church where it is like we really don't we don't need the local community we're just going to do it at home we could I mean I my family homeschools I know Christopher's family homeschools so I, I think this is a fine option but home church I mean, unless you're unless you're the Swiss Family Robinson and you're on, you know, if you don't have a church, do what you can. But uh, no, the home and family support the life of the church. They don't substitute for the life of the church. Am I doing okay for time, Chris? Or? Uh, you're to have time. Okay, so I need to wrap up so you can. If you want, yeah. you can just keep going. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to get out of it that. Uh, <laughs> Say something about the significance of the festivals because that ties in exactly what you're saying. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. That's what you're yeah, and I, I'm not going to go into details on the festivals mainly because of time, but you, you're absolutely right. I mean, the festivals were there, and the head of the household is uniquely responsible. Uh, he, he represents his family, so in that sense, the father is sort of carrying the family with him, the way the high priest carries Israel into the Holy of Holies. And the way our Lord Jesus carries us into the Holy of Holies, made without hands, eternal in the heavens. But then the Father also brings his family to the church. With Elkanah and Hannah, Hannah waits until she's weaned the boy, but then she goes. And every year he brings the family, and Joseph brings the family to Jerusalem. And tying it in then to our Christian festival of Christmas and Easter, and the extent to which fathers teach the meaning of this. Christmas isn't Santa Claus. Right. They, Easter is the Easter Bunny. Well, that, that, that's absolutely right. And that's part, uh, that's what I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, I may not get into the detail that you're looking for, but um, I'm, I'm trying to lay some foundations and then, uh, and then Chris is going to talk about some specifics and offer some examples. So, um, I already mentioned the passage, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all fatherhood on earth is named. I know sometimes it's by whom all families, but it's, it's paternal families, it's fatherhood. And uh, again, we fathers learn from him how to be fathers. He's not called a father by analogy to us. We become fathers by imitation of him, and we learn from him what it means uh, to be fathers. And then very specifically, St. Luke uh, chapter 11, 
uh, Lord, teach us to pray as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And then interestingly, not only does Jesus teach us to pray to his God and Father as our God and Father, which he is, especially by virtue of our baptism and by virtue of the fact that he's named us with his name and given us the adoption of sons, poured out the spirit of his son upon us. But then Jesus specifically at the end of that section, right, he says, if, you know, if your son asks you for an egg, you're not going to give him a scorpion. And if he asks for a piece of bread, you're not going to give him a rock. And then that very sobering, humbling word, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So there's, there's a lot going on in that passage, and it's really quite profound. But what I would suggest is, is a few things. First of all, that, that fathers themselves ought to pray. You remember what Jesus was doing when they came and asked him? He was praying, as he's often doing in Luke. So fathers should, should practice prayer and intercession themselves. And they should teach their children to pray by giving them the words that Jesus has given, and by teaching them how to pray to their father according to his word and promise, and by praying with them and for them, even before they're old enough to speak, even yet in the womb, so that they are, they're kind of gathered up into the prayers of their father. And then fathers also teach their children to pray, and this goes back to what I was alluding to before, by the way they respond to their children's needs and their children's requests. So that uh, it doesn't mean that they're gonna just give their children whatever they want, but they're going to listen to their children and a attend to their needs and answer their requests uh, in love. Uh, and, and in this way, their children are gonna learn what their father in heaven is like, and they're gonna learn how to ask their dear father in heaven as children here ask their dear father on earth. I mean, that, that explanation from the Our Father in the Catechism, it doesn't even make sense if children aren't learning from their own fathers to seek what they need from them and to receive what they need from them. Okay? Um, picking up uh, from 1 Timothy 3, where Paul is talking about the qualifications of a bishop, and he talks about how he must be able to manage his own household and family well, and so on and forth. I mean, we could talk about that a lot, and I suspect that for all of us, it would, it would convict us and call us to repentance, but hopefully also then to flee to Christ for his forgiveness, and finding mercy there to have mercy for our children. But the main point I wanna make is what Paul does there demonstrates uh, the way in which the household and family of God and the household and family um, on earth have there's a continuity between them there's a comparison between them and so what i would like to suggest is first of all that the home is is like a, a, a little micro church if you will not not in place of the church as i said before but that the home is also um, an extension of the household and family of god and that within the home again i use this hopefully not too clever language the paternal care of pastors who are spiritual fathers, and the pastoral care of fathers who are familial pastors within their home. So that they care for, I mean, parents, I, I suspect most of you, probably all of you, are parents, uh, or certainly if you're not, you're a, pa you're a pastor to parents. But parents do have a difficult job because they really straddle both kingdoms. They straddle the third and fourth commandments. They are to teach their children the word of God, but they're also to exercise the sword uh, to discipline their children. This, I mean, it's a challenge. I don't think there's any more difficult job on earth. Uh, but part of that job, especially for a father, is a pastoral care for his children. He is to shepherd his children, to provide them with food and uh, protection and uh, nourishment, and also to lead them and guide them, all of those things that shepherds do for sheep, the, the father is to do for his children. So uh, I'll move through this last part quickly because it already will segue into what Chris is gonna talk about, that the, the, what the father is doing, just like Adam did for his sons and really going all the way down. I mean, Adam didn't have a lot of rubrics, a lot of rites and ceremonies, but he had some and he taught them to his sons. Uh, and the Old Testament Israelites had the rubrics, rites and ceremonies, the liturgical year that God gave them. We also have received from those who have gone before us, from our fathers in the faith, from our fathers in Christ. And so the father in his home is going to be teaching his family uh, the life and rhythm of the church and bringing them into that life and rhythm of the church, bringing them to the divine service, and then bringing them home from the divine service to um, 
not not imitate obviously the divine service in the home but to live from the divine service in the home and I, I think actually the liturgical year as this gentleman was talking about really is is such a huge benefit in helping fathers to know what to talk about uh, if you if you look at um, Luther's comments in the large catechism on the second article it's like the shortest section of the large catechism the second article because he basically says well we preach on this all year long, especially on the major festivals of Christ. The church here just kind of lays it out there. You, we're, we're immersed in the second article of the creed all year long. So what, what I would like to say is that fathers and mothers, actually mothers probably can be even more instrumental in this, so that the home actually reflects what's happening in the life of the church and that there's a connection, there's a road between them. And the fathers are bringing their children to church and teaching them by their example and also availing themselves of the divine service and the means of grace, and then bringing their children from the Lord's altar into the life of the family and allowing the word of God that is heard and received in, in the life of the church to echo within the life of the family. And uh, this is actually very historically Lutheran, uh, at least in my, in my reading and so forth. There was always uh, a, a deliberate connection between the church, the home, and the school. And uh, so you had this consistent catechesis happening. And the catechesis was certainly instruction in the catechism, instruction in the scriptures, but it was also instruction in the actual life of the church, the practice of daily prayer, the practice of receiving the divine service, the practice of worship and prayer and sacrifices of thanksgiving, and so on and so forth, going all, all the way back to Adam. So Chris, if you can go, I don't know how you arrange it. Yeah, okay. So let me just end with this and then pass the, the torch to Chris. So living as the little ones of God, which is what we want to teach our children to do, but um, that, that also begins with us. Yeah. Unless we receive the kingdom of God like a little child, we will not enter it. So it, it, it really isn't sufficient for fathers to say to their children, well, look, you got to go to church. I'm going to drop you off for Sunday school and we'll pick you up. Or, or something like that, or you should say your prayers be go, before you go to bed, or you should pray before a meal. No, fathers also, these are not, these are childlike things, but they are not childish things. And so fathers also live as little ones of God, but, but then as fathers, they teach their children to live as little ones of God. So they teach the faith and life, the paternal care and discipline, and I hinted at that earlier, uh, with, with having rules and regulations, with appropriate consequences, promises, and blessings, but also an exercise of forgiveness. So that the home is marked by contrition and repentance, confession and absolution. And that's not only that the children confess to their father and he forgives them, but it means the father also confesses his sin and looks for forgiveness. That he goes to confession and absolution himself, but that he also confesses his sin when he sins against his wife and children which I'll just be honest, I, I find it hard for me to do. Um, it, it's very humbling to have to say to my child, you know what, I lost my temper, I sinned against you, I was wrong, forgive me. But I have taught my children that this is, this is how we live as the children of God. And we learn to live that way from the rhythm of the life of the church, which is also marked by contrition and repentance, confession and absolution. We seek the promises of God so that there is this ongoing catechesis that happens within the fellowship of the church. Well, there's lots more that I could say and would love to say, but I also want to give Chris some time. I don't know how long I've gone past, but I'll uh, turn it over to you. Uh, a question. Just ask a question while he's transitioning here. In the, your example of, it was just a revelation, I guess, when you're talking about uh, fatherhood in the Old Testament and the kings of Israel. The kings of Israel seem to be a negative example of that um, in, in the way that God talks about them, right? That they'll take your sons and they'll take your daughters from you to be a new father. Can you kind of well, comment he, on... I mean, he warns them from the start, right? And Samuel right. warns them. But then he goes ahead and gives it to them. Right. And then the beauty of it is that within that kingship he gives them David and then David is a type of Christ and so and the Lord is the one who is their king to begin with and then that finally comes full circle because our Lord Jesus Christ is both God and man and son of David and son of God and 
Um, you do have some kings that actually do right. I mean, Hezekiah right. and Josiah in particular. And what is the key to their what is the key to their um, success and faithfulness? They find the word of God, they read it, they teach it, and they say, "We got to do this." And so they they implement that. Did you want to use the chair? I had taken it away, and it would have been disastrous. Yeah. yeah. Been kind of funny. Uh, all right, so uh, I feel like I'm coming in on the eighth inning. I'm a Raldis Chapman, and I'm going to pitch the Cubs into the World Series now, right? So uh, I'm Christopher Gillespie. I'm actually here as the uh, representative from the Worship and Spiritual Care Committee for the district. Um, we've had convention or conferences in the past, but uh, the district would like us to actually come and enlist support and, and present at our various conferences throughout the year. So why am I here? Uh, this is my family, and uh, I have eight children, if you're counting, and uh, you can see them all there. Um, but my background, I'm a um, son of, let's see, I'm one of three. Both of my parents were working parents, um, faithful parents, but they both were full-time jobs. I'm a school teacher, dad worked at Purdue. Um, so that made things a little challenging when it came to our prayer life at home, uh, which was on and off again, if, if ever. Um, so we were often just strapped for time. We went to uh, St. James Lutheran in Lafayette, so um, had a great opportunity there to learn the faith in the school, um, but then also um, that also challenged us because we lived half hour away and travel time and then sports and all that stuff that you all know about. Uh, I've been married to Anne for 18 years. And my wife comes from a broken home, so her parents separated and divorced when she was young, and, but also Lutheran. Both of them Missouri Synod, so um, she has that background as well, but that her mom, being a single mom effectively, didn't have much opportunity to catechize at home. You can see where I'm going with this. Uh, so my eight children, I have four that have a seizure disorder. Some of you know that. And uh, one of them, uh, Naomi, here in the yellow, um, she had infantile spasms when she was very young and it caused uh, damage to her brain. So she has uh, autistic spectrum among uh, the difficulties with seizures, that affects the home as well. Uh, I'm the pastor of a small congregation. It was small when I got there, and it's even smaller today. Um, so it's, uh, that, that's difficult. And one of the reasons it was small is because they didn't, um, as was identified for me, it was told to me when I came, um, they had not been regular in God's Word. They didn't go to Bible study. There was no real instruction of how to pray at home. And so um, at least the elders viewed that as one of the big challenges coming into the congregation from the beginning. So I made that an emphasis right from the beginning. Uh, the consequence, it's pretty obvious, and if you have pastors know this, uh, you can see in their own home, or you can see in the, in the lives of the, of the homes in the congregation, the effect of a lack of catechesis, I think. Um, and that's, in my congregation, I have one family that has more than one generation in the church. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the families are all disrupted from the congregation, thankfully some just across multiple congregations, but most of them, um, actually their children have left either the Lutheran faith or Christianity altogether. So uh, that's a challenge there. Uh, you got some handouts. We'll get to the, the blue and the white, but the coffee thing, that's a side business that I've got going that I do um, to help supplement uh, my income from the small church that you already mentioned. Um, but also I do media production and I do that for higher things. I've done work for CPH, I have a project with Lutheran Public Radio, and so I'm kind of sensitive to new media, and you'll see that in a moment. Okay, so some of the, the cha obvious challenges, we already talked about time, um, priorities, so where's the church in the life of the family? Um, I think a big challenge for me personally was how to do it, how to pray at home. Um, as you heard what I told you about my background, I didn't grow up in a home that prayed. So not knowing how to do it. Um, I didn't really have encouragement to do this from pastors for the most part. So uh, it, maybe it, it was happening to my parents, but it didn't make its way to me, right? So then when it became my turn to be a father and a husband, head of a household, I didn't really know uh, what to do. Thankfully, I had a pastor that did direct me, finally, um, right before I went to seminary. And there's probably a lot of other challenges that come to mind for you. So we'll just keep moving. Uh, I think some of the less obvious challenges I've tried to list for you here, 
Um, some of these are personal opinion. You probably have others again. Uh, one is the what I would call a secular disruption of the catechetical tradition. So Lutherans, you know, we have a small catechism. But when I visit people's homes or when I talk to them, I feel like I'm going into Saxony and I'm visiting them. <laughs> you remember what happened when Luther visited Saxony, right? I mean, not, the pastors didn't even know what the Bible taught. Um, and I feel the same way because I, I don't know what your experience is, but I, um, it's, a, it's a rare home that has uh, the Lutheran service book. Some of them might have an LW. Many of them have a TLH somewhere that they might be able to find, but the hymnals largely absent. Um, they don't know where their catechism is, but they have lots of Bibles, but they're on the shelf, of course. So it seems a lot like uh, Saxon visitation. And I think that's because of kind of the worldly pressures that, you know, what should our priorities be at home? And it's all the things you mentioned already that Adam's six children were prioritizing, right? Work and play and what were the other two? Science. And Science, art. And arts, music. Right. music. Good stuff. Yeah, good stuff uh, in its place, right? Um, I think one of the other challenges is the faithfulness of the resources you use. There's a lot of things out there. Um, but, for example, uh, teaching your children that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh um, isn't the message of salvation. But there are some materials that have suggested that that's the reason why our kids are leaving the church, because they don't believe in a seven-day creation. I think that actually um, maybe even sells the demonic message a little short, doesn't it? Is that it's really at the heart of Christ, and who is who is Jesus, and uh, those materials sometimes don't even deal with that question at all. So watch out for that. Um, we already mentioned that the materials don't necessarily drive the family back to the life of the church and of the liturgy. Um, doesn't necessarily encourage him singing at home, so it doesn't actually complement um, Sunday morning. And actually, there's there's many other examples you can think of, not just materials for the home, but um, even throughout the church, that seem to have no bearing on what happens um, in the in the liturgy, right? And but that are meant to keep our, especially children, in the church. Uh, I'm not going to give any examples. Maybe you have some things that come to mind. Um, yes, that I already mentioned that the materials don't always indicate growth in faith in Christ. They <laughs> might teach, you know, what we might call secondary doctrine, an important doctrine to learn. But, but not driving us back to faith. Uh, so the example, you've heard this one, um, especially Sunday school materials, right? That they teach the Bible stories, but they don't necessarily teach them as confessing Jesus. They actually teach moral examples, for example, um, with, uh, say, you know, David, he uh, slew Goliath and with five smooth stones, right? See, I don't even remember the story very well. Five smooth stones, um, and then, so you need to take up, what are your five smooth stones so that you can slay your Goliaths or something? Uh, an example. Uh, <laughs> there are, I think, also some false assumptions. Um, this one's a little bit hard to hear, I think, but it has to do with perseverance of faith, the work of the Holy Spirit in children. Um, there are some assumptions that if we do everything just right, that our children will automatically believe um, and I think it does need to be said, said that many faithful Christian parents who do catechize in their home still end up suffering under um, the apostasy of their children and uh, even doing it all right. Of course, we have the flip side where people say, I raised my children right, and they really didn't teach them the faith, so you have to beg the question, what does that really mean? So we want to be careful about that. That doesn't... Um, just because we can't be guaranteed our children will remain in the faith doesn't negate actually the command and will of God that we teach our children. So, all right. So resources, we, this is the practical part of this, again, ninth inning, so let's head it home, right? Uh, old media, actually, I mentioned the Saxon visitation, small catechism especially, um, is your first go-to resource. And the catechism actually teaches you how to pray, doesn't it? You know, Luther tells you what to do in the morning and the evening. I, it's it laid out. It's not hard. It's really easy to implement. But for some reason, we just don't want to do it. Um, personally, for me, um, my our prayer life really didn't start until after seminary and actually after being a pastor for a few years. And um, and it, again, I think it's because I had that lack of example. Mm -hmm. um, in part, I also um, needed a little conviction. Um, not in a sense of, like, I really want to do this, because I had that, um, but, like, I, like, 
he's doing it and I'm not. In the case of a friend, we were visiting, who happens to be a pastor as well, and he was reading a story to his children and asking them questions, and they were repeating back answers to him. I said, that's catechesis, and he's doing it with his family. And so I was ashamed, right, uh, and confessed, and then we implemented what I was already doing, telling the congregation to do, but I myself wasn't actually doing it fully, um, which is a whole other problem um, to evaluate yourself. I mentioned hymnal. The Lutheran service book has very brief orders of daily prayer. For let's see, what is it? Morning, noon. Does it have an afternoon? Early, Early evening. Yeah, and, e and evening. Plus, you could also, if if you're really gung ho, you could pray matins or vespers, or morning prayer, evening prayer, Compline, if you let your kids stay up late, um, which we don't. Uh, I mentioned the scriptures, but I, you see, it's kind of low on the list, and I, maybe that strikes you as a little odd. The Bible should be at the top, but. Um, you know, having a Bible in the home is a relatively recent innovation. Um, thank you, Gutenberg, right? And uh, reading the scriptures isn't always easy to do with children. I'm going to show you some resources in a moment. Um, because where do you start and what do you read? And do you just work through a book? Do you try to read them a Pauline epistle, for example? Or do you just do a story? But then how do you do the story? Um, this is why the catechism and um, the lectionary and the liturgy um, these things drive kind of the life of prayer in the home, too. And they tell us, they show us what scriptures um, to read. They lead that, I think, for us in a wise way, because we're not always so good about it. Um, so hymnal, I should show you. I have, I have illustrations. What do you call this? Object lesson. Object lesson. Yeah, it's some, it's a, it's, I don't have children's sermons. I didn't put that up there. I'm sorry. That's something you could do. Uh, anyway, there's a hymnal. Uh, but I mentioned the Treasury Daily Prayer. Do you know this resource? Um, I actually I have print copies, but I don't use them because the, the app is easier to use because it has the orders of service here that, I'm sorry, I, I know you're a print media guy and you worked on this book, but you know, <laughs> it's, you know you, this, it's really obvious what part you're supposed to, that's the order of service because it's in red here, you see that? Okay. But then you have to find the, the mark, the, look how many ribbons they give you, right? <laughs> so if you have the app, it automatically plugs in all the stuff. From the various parts of the book into the service, so it's all laid out. If you have an iPad, it's just it's it's brilliant. So, what uh, is the name of the app? Uh, it's called Pray Now. Pray Now, all one word. Search for it on the App Store. Um, I actually, based upon what what Rick had presented to us, which is I think entirely harmonious with uh, Peter Bender's approach. Um, that's what I've used, and this was given to me by um, John Pless at the Fortman Seminary. So it's how he taught me to catechize. And then I went to Vicarage Congregation that used uh, Lutheran Catechesis from uh, Peter Bender and his congregation. Uh, so then I used it as well. You, you tend to use what you know, right, and what you've learned. So it looks like this now. It's hardcover. It's so beautiful. And uh, it it's really you want to say it, extensive, <laughs> which is also a challenge, right? Especially for a new pastor and for a congregation that hasn't done this sort of thing before. So, by the way, I'm just going to keep going. I know we're right at time, so if you have to leave, you can go and start drinking, but otherwise, stay here. <laughs> um, so, Lutheran Catechesis, and it's, it is a complete approach to um, catechism for home and school. Um, because that their congregation, where it's based out of, also has a day school, um, and it puts it puts faith and, and, and doctrine right at the center of the life of the church, the home, and the school. So, like we heard, so you can look at this. I have a copy of it, um, and then I mentioned other print resources, things that I don't use, but they're there. Portals of Prayer is one. I know people use that uh, in the congregation. I don't know um, how it is today, but I think it was getting better at one point. So. So at one point, it was a little bizarre. So there you go. Personal opinions, just set those aside. Uh, but I mentioned new media, and some of these things I'm directly involved with, so I have to pardon the plug. But I, there's probably others that I don't even know about. Um, sermon podcasts. Yeah, I spelled that right. Good. Um, maybe it's it's a little controversial to listen to a, someone else's preaching. You should listen to your pastor. Um, all of this catechesis in the home is, again, not intended to substitute for being in the liturgy and in the Word 
in your congregation with your pastor, being under his pastoral care. On the other hand, you can compliment it, right? And it might be helpful to hear someone else's uh, take, for lack of a better word, on the text that you were preached in your parish. I actually do this as a pastor. I just listen to, I don't know, probably seven or eight different sermons. And they're not all using the same lectionary I use either. So um, uh, it's a way for me to be hearing other people preach through new media. I think it's a blessing, uh, much like print media. Uh, issues, et cetera, you know about that, hopefully. Um, but that's a way of engaging text with contemporary topics. Uh, Lutheran Public Radio is a wonderful resource that the Issues guys put together. How many know Lutheran Public Radio? Oh, okay, fine. Um, but hymnody, right? We want to encourage that life of hymnody. You'll find that if you have it playing and it's familiar, the kids will join in. Uh, and it's really beautiful to hear at home. Um, Brotherhood of John Steadfast, they have all sorts of things that maybe I don't want to recommend, but they do have something that's really nice. Uh, gospel Notes. Do you know this? It's geared toward the one-year lectionary, so three-year guys, I'm sorry, you're out of luck here, but um, it's a front and back, one page. I've been doing it for about a year, I think. They have the whole year done, I believe. And uh, it's something that's intended to hand out to the congregation, but it's actually, it's just an exegetical study uh, at a lay level um, through the gospel text, and it's really helpful, and you can distribute that if you like. Uh, I mentioned Higher Things. Um, that's, again, a plug for the work for them. But their most popular resource are called the Reflections, by far. Um, and almost all of their financial support comes from people that listen or read the Reflections. So um, that's available as a print thing that you can print out a booklet for your congregation, or it's a podcast. You can listen to it in your ears each day. They have video shorts and podcasts. Um, so our approach in our congregation is this. Um, it's called the Congregation of Prayer. And again, this is from Peter Bender. I gave you a, a white copy of what he hands out. That was for last week, I believe. All right. And it's, like I said, it's extensive. And he's taught his congregation over 25 years how to use this. They use it in their school. They use it in their um, every congregational meeting. Um, anytime the, the congregation is gathered, um, to study God's word or to even deliberate, just deliberate matters, they use this resource. But I showed you my implementation of it. Uh, it doesn't look good on the screen, but you've got a print copy, so you can see it's front and back. Some of this I borrowed from your version as well, so because I liked your prayers better. But anyway, um, I actually reordered it from from Bender. It follows pretty closely. I think the order of evening prayer, the evening prayer short order from LSB. If I remember correctly. Um, but you can see what you do, and the instruct the really helpful instruction is right at the top. Uh, pray and confess aloud as much from this order of meditation and prayer as you are able, as your family size and age is dictating. Uh, and then learn by heart. So there's two two notes. There's one I mentioned I have a large family. Bedtime is that's when we do it, because morning time is like the older kids are still asleep until ten and then with homeschool. Anyway, and the younger kids are raring to go at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> but the one thing we have consistently is everybody's up at about 7 o'clock when the little ones go to bed. So that's when we do it. And we sit all down. We go in, a, we, we go in one of the bedrooms for that. Um, and we actually do, we, we don't do the song right now because we still have too many really little ones. Probably pull that off. But we do the verse of the week. Uh, we confess the Right now, we're just confessing the explanation. Second article is we have a creed on the back. And then I have assigned a reading. Um, again, I got this mostly as a vendor, uh, a hymn. And then um, if you want to use another resource, you can do that. And then we pray the daily things for prayer. And um, if we miss a day, I try to catch the petition from the day we missed. Uh, but we just do it like it's the Ectani, I guess is what it's called. So, you know, I say, let's pray. And then we I just say, for faith, to live in the promises of holy baptism. Let us pray to the Lord, and they say, Lord of mercy, which is what we do in church, and they're doing it at home, so it works out really well. Uh, we make special petitions for people in the congregation. I don't print those on here because they're in the service folder. And then the 22nd Sunday after Trinity, that was the collect, Apostles Creed, Lord's Prayer, morning and evening prayer, and the catechism. And you're like, well, that's a lot to do. It actually isn't. Um, I think average is probably 12 minutes. Now, when it gets to the reading, um, do you just read the text? You could. 
Um, but that's that's the golden opportunity, really, to interact with your children, right? So what was it? What did we just do? Um, the Lord remembers Noah. I think that's a nice text to go with what we're talking about. Um, Genesis 8, uh, 1 to 22. We've been working through the flood. And uh, then we have questions. And I didn't bring the right binder because I didn't because they're using it while I'm here tonight. So, because um, my oldest son will lead the prayers when I'm not there because he's learned how to do it in that nice. I mean, it is. That's the whole point, isn't it? We're talking about. Um, so this, this is also from Peter Bender. And there's a whole series of binders that go with all the reading schedules that he's got. And uh, it's just catechism questions. Uh, these were written not by Bender, but by uh, Pastor Carl Fabritius, who's up in Wisconsin somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, so, for example, Jesus begins his public ministry, and he just asks, uh, when did Jesus come preaching in Galilee? After John was put in prison. It's just what the text says, right? So you just repeat back what you just heard. What did he preach? The gospel of the kingdom of God, etc. But even for a pastor, after a long day, I don't really want to think that hard about what questions I should be asking. Again. So I use it. Um, sometimes I ask others. Sometimes I skip question if it's too hard for them. But it's, again, a resource. Uh, for a parent to buy this set would be, I think the whole set's like 150, if I remember right. Because it's 12 binders, a lot of readings. It's three years' worth of readings. Um, and I think they, have a, they were working on a new resource, a way to do that, like on a Kindle. But I think that project stalled at the moment. But anyway, um, but that again, you can read the reading, but you really should just kind of talk through it, ask the questions, find out what's going on. I think at some point I'll probably become comfortable enough I won't use the binder. But like I said, when I'm gone, um, my oldest son, who's 15, can lead the prayer that way. Um, also, then Sunday morning, we use this resource called Lessons for Lambs. Again, it's geared towards one year. Um, this was from uh, Pastor John Sias, who's now a big way. He's a secretary of the Senate, uh, but his wife, Heidi, made these for his congregation in Colstrip, Montana, before he was elected. This is the, the front and back, so it has um, the bulletin card that we use as well from higher things. Um, it has a little bit of a what to listen for during the service, and then on the back they have a crossword puzzle because you know they get bored in church. Uh, but on the inside it has the readings, and then you can have, it says, Questions to talk about with your parents, right? So it works really well with the, the middle to older age children, too, because they'll ask questions about that. A person from the Bible, a little bit of catechism, a little bit of the hymn of the day for that day. All right, so that's a resource. This is one year. And that's one year. I, I don't know if there's a three-year version. I'm, somebody should do it. You should do it. Three, three years? <laughs> Make it. I mean, I know it's three times as much work, but anyway. Um, you can actually do some catechesis for the home in your Sunday service folder, if you have a congregation that doesn't care about you cutting down massive amounts of trees, which mine really wanted me to cut down trees because they didn't want to hold the hymnal because they're too heavy. So um, so I use that to my advantage, okay? And uh, this I picked up from um, Pastor Scott Bruzer, who has an extensive service folder each week. I think he has their life. He cuts down a lot of trees. Yeah, he cuts down a lot of trees because it's eight and a half by 11 booklet. And it's probably like 16 to 20 pages. I don't know. There's lots of white space, which I'm like, I'm not leaving any white space. We're going to make everything fit. One of the things I use are the um, lectionary summaries. This is from LCMS. And those are available for three year, one year and three year. Just search for it on the LCMS site. I put that right on the cover. I love this bulletin image. Isn't it beautiful? And somebody <laughs> posted on Facebook a version of this. And I think you commented on it, where they drew black wisps going between the mouth, because this looks like Professor Quirrell, and, and it made it like he was a Dementor throttling his fellow servant, but whatever. Sometimes the bulletin art's just great, you know. I love the, the demon coming out of the guy's mouth, and the, oh, what's the, the circumcision one's really good, too. Yeah. This is Higher Things Art. These are Higher Things Art. So it's, that's not in the public domain, right? Uh, it's free for congregational use once you buy it. I think it's a $20 CD. It's, but it it's, needs to be purchased. Yeah, you have to buy it, but then after that, you can use it for whatever you want. You can put it online. You can use it in, as like bulletin cover, whatever. It doesn't matter. Inside, then, this is why I got from Bruzic. You can't read it. This is a quote from Hammer of God. Um, just a little quote, because I had some white space, and I like to use that. And then they can, you know, people are using this in their home. They'll read that. And they'll ask me, like, what was that from? Who is, who is Bo Geertz? Uh, but this is the famous quote about how the, 
how the Lord doesn't want your uh, rusty can of a heart. <laughs> you know, you can just, that's not a fine birthday gift indeed. Uh, then I have a quote from uh, uh, Bill Swirla about the liturgy. Really wonderful quote about, about that. And what else did I have? Oh, a quote from Hal St. Bob uh, from The Power of Forgiveness about our fast food culture and how it doesn't really, it's not compatible with the liturgy. Other old media you can do, um, we do a family Bible study because I have no Sunday school teachers and all the children are mine. So it's automatically a family Bible study, but uh, um, the older ladies primarily and some of the men who come, I, don't, I have uh, probably three or four men in the congregation. So that's one of the challenges. How do you restore a congregation without fathers? Uh, I think it's pretty hard, but um, we do that as a family and that's one way because then now we're all interacting multi, uh, uh, multi, multi-generational. And I think there's some wisdom to that that we're going to struggle with as the church diminishes. That might be one of the blessings that come out of that for us. Uh, Karen Leader, this is also from uh, the, I mean, you're like Jake Arrieta or uh, actually more like, um, who's the other pitcher? Cubs fans, where are they? Who's the guy that went seven, and, seven three quarter innings? Yeah, Hendricks, right, to win. You're like Hendricks. I mean, you got me all the way to the end. But Karen Leader, um, that's the old German word, it's core hymnody. So there, I mean, there's a set of hymns that really, as Lutherans, you ought to know, right? And you can dispute which ones are the biggest priorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you can probably name them off. Luther's hymns, obviously, are in the top 25, probably, of all of them, I think. Um, but to teach those a congregation very intentionally, so to have them multiple times throughout the year. Um, there's a resource called the Narrative Divine Service, or the Divine Service with Commentary. It's listed different names. That's from Professor John Class. He used it at uh, Minnesota, University of Luther, Minnesota, when he was there. And uh, you can just Google it, and you'll find it. Uh, it's a commentary for each part of the liturgy. I think it's geared, actually, towards Divine Service 1, if you're not into the, the uh, what do you call it, the common service. Uh, Book of Concord insorts, so you can catch those would go home again. LCMSSermons.com, I think there's both three-year and one-year for those as well. I made a resource on our website, gracedire.org, you can go look at that. You have to make it for yourself, because what I did is we have all these symbolic stained glass windows, because they were made by a Protestant guy who didn't believe in like images that represent anything. Um, Except for he has one picture of Christ with the child's bowl, which I think is the best. But anyway, um, so I went through and I took a picture of each image and then described what was in the scene. Because invariably, you would have, I don't know, probably five to ten questions a year. Pastor, what is that window all about? Like the one that's a pomegranate. What is a pomegranate doing in church, right? Plus, it didn't even, doesn't even really look like a pomegranate. Um, so you have to explain that. Or, Pastor, why does that window have, um, i got to remember, get it wrong here. I think it's five loaves and three fish. So why, why does it have five loaves? It, it's because the guy doesn't actually think that me feeding the 5,000 and 4,000 are two separate events. <laughs> and he mixed it up. It's you know, not seven, seven, what was it, seven loaves, two fish, and then right. he mixed it up. I mixed it up too now because I was looking at that window. It's right next to the uh, lectern. Anyway. Uh, and then new media that you can use, uh, you can do stuff on your website if you have that, and that's great for potential visitors, they can read all about you, and you can catechize them, but I actually direct members of the congregation. If they have a question about something, it's probably already on there. And so then I can talk to them, but then I can direct them to that as well. Um, you can use email. People still read it, um, unless you're like some of my family that have 12,000 unread emails in their inbox. It's just like, why even bother at that point? Just give up. But. Uh, but anyway, you can send out your sermons, your Bible classes, pastoral letters, festivals, and commemorations uh, if you'd like to recognize those, and um, we do. Um, you can send those in email so people get them, you know, and uh, it's another way to kind of get into the home, I think. I do a little resource that was requested to me, um, unfortunately by a family who's now left, but um, they wanted to teach their daughter, what, to prepare her for what was going to happen the next week. So I send out on email post on the website too. Uh, it has the lectionary summary, it has the readings with electronic links, so you can just go read it. You don't have to pull out your Bible, you can just click on it. I list all the hymns that we're going to sing with links to video or um, audio if you want to hear the tune because you don't remember what, that, what, what the hymn was like. So you can prepare as little or as much as you need to there. 
Um, there's plenty of stuff online that you can do. You can podcast, you can stream, you can YouTube. Goodbye. Uh, and then you can use other new media. Some of this is a little tricky with copyright, which we talked about with higher things. Um, or you can just play dumb until they sue you. And that would be uh, <laughs> Facebook and YouTube recorded and live streaming and devotion. Chad Pendle here. I can say hi. Good. Um, you do a, like a little devotion for your congregation on Facebook, right? Video devotion. Just with a webcam. You don't have to have special equipment or anything like that. Just shoot a little video. Talk to your congregation. If, even if it's just a meditation on something that you're studying, um, you can share that with them that way. And then, uh, is that it? I think, oh no, yeah, that's it. So that's what I do in um, Congregation at Grace. Um, everything I, I'm doing, it's really helpful to say, it's partly based upon my background, <laughs> where I came from, uh, and where I'd like to go, but I realized that I mean, even what I'm doing is a lot. Uh, I, I view it kind of like, a, I'm not a hunter, but one of those guns with the, all the, the shotguns where it's just, it's just, just throw it out there and see what sticks, right? <laughs> or what kills. Shotgun's not a good analogy. Um, but, but also, I mean, it's, it's really driven by, um, as a father and a husband, not, not just a pastor, um, what I am, am convinced is appropriate for my family, right? To support my children. And uh, as I mentioned, and, and at least in my case, my children are at the heart and center of the next generation of our congregation because there aren't other children for the most part. Uh, there's two others uh, that regularly attend. And so um, uh, that's really encouraging um, for the older generation. It's also discouraging uh, as well because I think they feel the conviction now, having seen their children and grandchildren. Um, it's almost weekly in Bible study for us. How do I engage my Buddhist granddaughter, you know, or, or the, the vehement atheist um, niece or whatever it is? Um, and really the only way we can restore it is uh, by being faithful to what God has given us to do, praying for his uh, grace. But we also see that, as you said, he, um, as Pastor Stuckler said, he's, he is the, the, the model because he is always, he's always our father, <laughs> even when we fail. And I, even though he can visit the sins of the father upon three or four generations, um, for those who return to faithfulness, the example of the Old Testament is that he restores the faithfulness um, by the Holy Spirit uh, nearly immediately. I'm thinking of like Nehemiah, right? And and it's like they remembered all the festivals all of a Sunday, all of a, all of a sudden. And they remember, it's like how did you over? It seems like overnight just by reading the book of the law before the people, and then God works through His Word. Um, to restore the faith. So I don't have this kind of fatalistic view, either of my own family or congregation, or I think the church on earth. Um, I don't know that's gonna go well for us, but I think um, if we make a, if we discipline ourselves to do do well, uh, the Lord will grant us uh, growth according to his will. So that's that's the presentation. Do you, we're over by like 15 minutes. So I don't think we'll ask questions. I think you can just come and find us and ask us if you have any. So Lord be with you. Thank you.